Okay, just gonna do a quick little video on uh, dielectric voidance and dielectric counter-voidance, or what you call attraction and repulsion. Now, first, let's take our weak, not very powerful. Sure, I got the polarity right. Yeah, I do. Take our weak disc magnet and let's bring it into, if I can get the angle right so you can see it here, into counter avoidance or what you call repulsion. You can see the shrinking away of the centripetal. I'll show you in another magnet here in a second what ultimately resultant you get is polarization in space <laughs> within a field. Remember, space is posterior to field. What you get is a spatial polarization between the two fields and counter avoidance, or what you call repulsion. And on this side, at this angle, at 90 degrees, it looks exactly the same as this pattern and the same over here. And in the center, what you get is, what you're doing is you're causing a rift in the ether. You can see it here at an angle. Now the disc magnet I have underneath here is rather weak, but you can see what is happening. Now let's bring it into a dielectric avoidance. Remember, all dielectricity wants to terminate itself counterspatially along lowest pressure gradients, and you'll see. If you can see right there in the center, you'll see a white spot. The dielectric inertial plane has already come to the midpoint before the joining of the two quote unquote magnets. Now the reason I use a weak disc magnet down here is if I use a really strong one, what it does is it overpowers this tiny little cube magnet because it looks at it like nothing. Pressure wise. Now let's use our little cylinder magnet. Wait for the pattern to form, and we'll bring them into counter avoidance, or what you call repulsion. Let me step away so you can see this. As I get close, let me see if you can see it on one side. Which, of course, is not easy to do. It's impossible to hold this. It's a great deal of force in bringing these together. What happens is, is you end up with a perfect little polarization jet here and over here, and a little dielectric, not a tear in the ether, but that is actually what you're doing. You're causing the opposite of what the dielectric wants to do. Dielectric voidance is terminating into counter space, bringing two oppositional radiative fields, i.e. the dielectric field and radiation, under tremendous pressure. It's like turning Mother Nature up on her head and uh, body slamming her, for lack of a better analogy. <laughs> I'll explain this in the third edition of Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. I need to get a better angle so you can see what is happening here. What are your, what's happening is, is I'm actually changing the polarization under, under immense pressure Since dielectricity cannot void this way, it does is it creates an equal polarization along these lines. Now, that was that. Let's take a look at our cube magnet. It's a little quarter inch cube, uh, N45 or N48, I believe. Here you can see either polarity. I remember our double hyperbolas here of radiation, i.e. the dielectric field.
Radiation equals polarization equals the space. The counter is spatial here. As I'm moving the magnet, you see the magnetism reciprocating in this conjugate system against the inertial plane, which is directed at and concentrated at, but not located at, the midpoint between all polarities. This is the driver. This is the engine behind every magnet. Magnetism does not induce magnetism. Magnetism is radiation. Magnetism does not attract anything. Magnetism displaces dielectricity. Radiation causes displacement of other things, but radiation itself does not attract anything. Yes, folks, you've heard it here. I'm sure you, some of you think that I'm insane. But this is not only a valid premise, but it is logically provable, and it is the premise behind all of Faraday's Tesla's, Steinmetz, Heaviside's work. That magnetism is the field of dielectricity in discharge. This is discharge. Magnetism is the radiative field. Remember, in a perfect magnet, the ratio of dielectricity and magnetism is 3.23606 to one part magnetism. And you're saying, well, how could that be? Shouldn't it be a ratio of 1 to 1 since all charge necessitates discharge? Well, if it were a 1 to 1 ratio between dielectricity, now I've proven this in the book, I won't get into that in this little short video, but if the ratio were 1 to 1, then the magnet would not be a permanent magnet. That dielectric capacitance, that inertia, resists great torque. You can destroy that inertia, that torque, by heating the magnet and other various variety of ways of destroying the magnet and thereby ruining the dielectric inertial capacitance or bringing it into incoherency. But that ratio is incommensurable. They're both golden section ratios between dielectricity and magnetism, by the way as proven geometrically in how magnetism reciprocates and conjugates within the system, but also in the ratio between dielectricity and magnetism in a perfect magnet, which of course there really are no perfect magnets. I mean, they come close, but I mean, under ideal perfect conditions, if the magnet's created perfect, if it's made perfect, which of course is never the case, but in the ideal absolute theoretical, that is the ratio of dielectricity to magnetism. You can see it here as I come along. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to string up the multicolored LEDs because uh, we'll see if those are powerful enough. But I just want you to see the interplay between two oppositional fields within a binding system. I like to get more questions. I'm all too ha together happy to answer questions. I have a lot of interesting stuff coming up in the third edition that you should like. Uh, the only error that I'm making is I'm trying to cram a ton of material under a short period of time, so I might have to come up with a fourth edition, so I don't want to produce a bad product, but I have just massive amounts to introduce. And I'll see where I get on getting everything into the third edition, but it's I knew the fourth edition would be necessitated. There's also some great inventions that uh, I can't necessarily introduce into the book at this time due to patent-seeking rights. So, some of the most fantastic stuff, unfortunately, I will have to leave out of the book, but there still will be amazing and fantastic stuff within the third edition. But just a few things that I cannot put in there. Because I can't put it on uh, YouTube or put it in a book if I'm going to see patent rights on it. So, thanks for watching this little short one. I was trying to show you voidance and countervoidance regarding electric uh, dielectricity. Remember, electricity is not nature's electricity. Electricity terminates as magnetism by the discharge of its dielectric component. But dielectricity is the fundamental nature of the inner atomic of all atoms and elements. Magnetism and dielectricity are the inner atomic volume between the discharging radius and picometers and the nucleus. The notion that atoms are 99.999% empty space is bunk, it's BS, it's nonsense, it's absolute rubbish and poppycock.
nor is there a discharge particle. To say there is a discharge particle is saying that a barren woman can have a child. To say that there is a discharge particle is the same thing as saying that uh, the ball thrown up into the air is a different ball than the same ball that falls down to the air. I got a call from Mother Nature yesterday and he, she wanted me to let you all know that uh, she never created a discharge particle. <laughs> there is no such thing as a negative charge. That's saying the same thing as saying uh, there is a hot ice. There is charge and there is discharge, but there is no negative charge. Negative charge is a misnomer. It's a mind virus of general relativity and quantum mechanics that has atomized our entire system of understanding as given to us by Tesla, Faraday, Steinmetz, Heaviside, uh, Maxwell, and others. Nature mediates charge and discharge, but there's no such thing as a discharge particle. It's rubbish and nonsense. Energy is a mass-free phenomena. We know this to be the case. There are currently endless numbers of patents that have been filed and soon within the next couple of years we'll see wireless devices for charging your iPhone from 10 and 15 feet away. The only downside to that of course is that such devices introduce uh, magnetoelectric fields into the air and uh, your animals are sensitive to it so it's not a good thing and a lot of people are sensitive to it so you start using such devices and your dog starts foaming at the mouth or your cat starts clawing your eyeballs out, you'll know the reason why. Animals are very sensitive to those sort of fields, so there's a huge upside and a massive downside to this new technology. Wireless is great up to one point, but ultimately it has some hideous side effects. Like my 6 inch neodymium iron boron, or even this little sucker. This is a powerful little magnet. The 6-inch neodymium iron boron that I have over here for testing purposes ca actually causes pain in my eyes and face after stooping over it and doing experiments. It actually causes physical pain in my eyes and face. I mean, that magnetism is radiation. I mean, every cell and every molecule and every atom within your body within the inner atomic has enormous amounts of dielectricity and magnetism. To think that that sort of massive amount of magnetic radiation doesn't affect you is absurd, but of course most people don't have a gigantic monster magnet like that to mess around with for a while, but it actually does cause physical pain. Anyway, that was a bit off topic, but I thought you'd find that interesting that uh, magnets can most definitely hurt you, and I don't mean by smashing them between your fingers, but just seeing they're stooped over them in testing purposes, they can actually hurt you quite dearly. I'm just going to show you this one last little neodymium really quickly. Remember, this is what our poles look like. This is turning over to the inertial plane. I'm going to try to set up a colored LED setup here soon on this ferro cell. As invented by Tim Vanderelli, a wonderful person, intelligent inventor. This is the hypertrochoid pattern that I predicted with 100% absolute accuracy long before seeing this pattern. This interlacing is the interlacing between centripetal and centrifugal field lines. The bending of the light is because uh, light is not only electromagnetic but has a z-axis radial dielectric component. You can read about that in the last part of my book, the part which is extremely important yet very few people have commented on. As I assume, I guess the map book is about magnetism. They never read that section. Remember that space is only the posterior attribute to any and all fields, but only radiative fields, such as magnetism and mass. But what makes mass massive, i.e. voluminous, is also magnetism. So all space is the byproduct of magnetic radiation. Ta-da! You should imprint that in your brain for all eternity for the rest of your life, okay? We have four fundamental forces, two principles of the universe, dielectricity and magnetism, two attributional relationships which are part dielectric and part magnetic, electricity and mass gravity. Electricity and mass gravity have attributes of both dielectricity and magnetism because they are both half 
electric I mean half dielectric and half magnetic electricity AC current lines transverse contain a magnetic component and a dielectric component the dissipation and discharge of the dielectric component is why electricity terminates as not into magnetism mass gravity is spatially accumulative due to magnetism but its field is centripetal is counterspatial the reason for that is is that all particles of which there are only two ultimately only one because beta decay and inverse beta decay proton turning a neutron neutron turning a proton protons are magnetically dominant and neutrons are dielectrically dominant so ultimately there is only one particle in the universe but those atomic nucleal particles are created from the termination of dielectricity inside enormous power generating systems such as galactic jets, stellar formations, and other supermassive energy formations in space. So that is why gravity mass is partially magnetic and partially dielectric and also why electricity is part magnetic and part dielectric and why electricity terminates as magnetism by losing in discharge its dielectric component. So now you have a fundamental understanding of the four principles and uh, maybe later we'll discuss the grand unified theory that I came up with about eight years ago and that is one over five to the power of negative three. That is the GUT, the grand unified theory of all fields and forces. I'll be long dead before anybody proves it, but that is what it is. It is 1 over 5 to the power of negative 3. Anyway, thanks for watching.